Good morning and welcome morning. to St. All Dates, everyone. Hi, good morning. My name is Lauren. And my name is Didier. And we're so glad to have you with us today. Yeah, I'm so glad to be back on the live stream. I love it here. Yeah, it's been a while, I but it's nice to have you with us. We love you as well. <laughs> I do too. I, she said it first. I sound like a copycat now. But I love you too. <laughs> and today is the sunny, sunny day. You might have seen in the comments, I've already put one in there saying good morning. Tell us how you're feeling, how you're doing, where you're at. I mean, today as we were coming in, I was just like, I want to be outside. I yeah, want to be in the presence nice. of God, but I would love to be out on a walk. Oh, presence of God in nature. I like that. To be fair, that is probably where I can connect with God the most. I like to go on little walks. Me too. And just little prayer walks. Sometimes it's not even a prayer walk. I'll just be yeah. every so often. Prayer say, walks are better God. in the sun though, aren't they? That is for sure. <laughs> it's like I'm not really there with an umbrella. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't quite have the same vibes. But we would love to know, for you guys watching at home, how do you best connect with God? Is it that you're in your room with a guitar? Is it that you are watching a live stream like today? Is it that you like to go out and walk and just pray? Or do you journal? What is it that you love to do to connect with God? Yeah, guys, let us know in the comments down below. We'd love to know your names. Give us your name, where you're from, and tell us how you best connect with God. Those uh, are the three, th three <laughs> criteria. All in one comment. Yeah, what please be speaking is, to us. We love from, it when you comment. And it's, how you... It makes it so fun. It gives us life. And it makes us feel like we're not just talking to a camera, <laughs> yeah. which is a much better way of going about this. We love to be yeah. talking to you. And hearing back from We you. love to hear from you guys, we really do. But since you are here and you've heard what my favorite thing is to do, what, how do you love to connect with God? I have to say, we're, it's quite similar, but if I was to add another level to it, my best place is right on the top of a mountain. Oh. You have to climb up all the way to the mountain, on the top of a mountain. I remember when I was like seven, it was the first time I was like up on a mountain. I was like, wow, I think God is real. <laughs> <laughs> Seven-year-old you had an epiphany. <laughs> Why is that so... That's so deep. At seven, I was like, I think I have two feet. That's <laughs> and they both work. <laughs> I wasn't on the top of a mountain thinking about God. That is very different. i got a lot of catching up to do. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. guys, please be do commenting and um, we'll reply to you as soon as soon as you see your comment. <laughs> but we are at um, the end of Easter. We've come to a, yes. the end of our Easter season. Um, but it was such a great time, wasn't it? Yeah, I had a great time. I mean, it's a packed week. Holy week. It feels like every day there's something going on. Morning Thursday, there Good Friday. There was so Friday. much. Which was your favorite service? Whew. I I was at all of them, so it was it was a busy time. But you're paid too. I, <laughs> <laughs> but my favorite was probably Easter Sunday. That's when we celebrate that He has risen. You know, it's it's a joyful day. Good Friday is a good time. It's somber though. I'm not a very somber person. <laughs> Easter Sunday is where it's at for me. Which was your favorite, Lauren? Oh, I actually loved the Good Friday service. That was oh. a beautiful time of worship. Um, that was really good, no. my favorite. But as Emily said last week, Easter is not just for Easter Day. It is for um, our whole lives. And she was calling us to be Easter people. So that was a great reminder. Yes, indeed. Mm. And it was nice to have a little segue going from the end of our Easter series into this new series that we're about to start today, which is about following the way of Jesus. It's called Follow. And it's basically about learning to be disciples because that is what we were all called to be. That's what Jesus said. Go out into all the world, make disciples of all nations. And today our pastor, Stephen Foster, is going to be talking to us about what that series is going to look like, what he wants us to learn. So, Lauren, if you don't mind. I'm going to teach out. <laughs> We've got Stephen here. Much more We're going to invite him to talk to us a little bit about what that is. And Susie, I've seen your message from New Zealand again. It's great to have you back with us. Susie's joined us from the mountains. Hey, Susie. In New Zealand. Great to have you with us. <laughs> <laughs> and good morning, Stephen. How are you? Morning, Ditz. Yeah, very well, thank you. Wonderful. Very well. Did you have a good break? I did. I had a wonderful time. I was actually near the mountains in Vienna for oh, a little while. Beautiful. So beautiful. That's it was proper. nice to have a little week. Proper, yeah, 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 yeah. Are you feeling rested, ready to go? Yeah, ready to go, really excited. Um, so today we're starting a new series uh, called Follow, looking at joining the way of Jesus. And so what does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to be an apprentice of Jesus? How can we do that? And so, uh, yeah, we're really excited about that. And we're going to look at the different things that Jesus says. There's, um, particular phrases Jesus uses when he talks about uh, 
being a disciple in the Gospels. And so we're going to look at each of those phrases. It's almost like discipleship according to Jesus. And uh, there's lots of great stuff out there on what it means to be a disciple. But we want to hear first and foremost from Jesus himself. And so that's the aim of these next few weeks. Wonderful. So, yeah. We're excited and looking forward to it. But why do you think that this is particularly important to the church right now? Uh, I think, well, there's two reasons. One is that um, uh, we've seen loads of people encounter Jesus over the last uh, three months, particularly, and before that. And so for, for, if you're new to faith, this is important because what does it mean to actually follow Jesus in your spiritual walk? But I think for everyone, uh, because the question isn't, am I a disciple? The question is, who or what is forming me? And so the world has a very good formation um, system. And so we're being shaped. Um, in Romans 12, it says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Don't, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold, but be transformed. And we want to be transformed by Jesus. We want to be shaped by Jesus, not by the world and the other influences. So whether you've been a Christian one week or uh, you've been following Jesus all your life, this is probably the most important thing to be looking at at this cultural moment, is what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. We'll be praying that... It's a powerful word that God speaks to you, but we're very excited to learn about how we can properly follow Jesus for ourselves and recognize that we are disciples, whether we like it or not, as soon as we say yes to Jesus. Amazing. So, and you might be able to help me out this year. I've got a little in, thing, yeah. <laughs> a tiny thing I might need Keep your Keep your with. eyes peeled. <laughs> Let's see if I have to help out today. I'm so grateful. Brilliant. I'll hand over to Lord. Wonderful. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Wonderful. So that's what we're going to be learning about, Loz. We'll be talking about discipleship. Now, what do you reckon it is to be a disciple? Hmm. I think I've been challenged recently. I actually um, went to a seminar on discipleship recently. Oh. And um, the challenge was as soon as you know Jesus, we're called to be a disciples. We're called to go, go and tell. Um, and... I think that's like one, you know, one of his greatest commandments of us to go and make disciples of all nations. So I think from the moment you meet Jesus, it's about um, going and telling other people, but not just leaving it there, actually walking with them throughout their journey with Jesus and helping them get closer to Jesus. Um, yeah. it's, it's an incredible thing that we both become disciples, that is people who are following Jesus, but also, in a way, we become disciples. We help others to do the same thing and to follow him. Yeah. And it's never at one point that you're either cons consuming or contributing. You're, you're always doing both. Yeah. It's kind of a parallel yeah, journey. And, and I'm sure people it. at home will have just, it's just the best feeling to walk alongside someone as, and point them towards Jesus and show them um, what you know of him and yeah. also learn from them as well. So... Yeah, it's, it's a great thing. Yeah. Do you have a, um, like, a moment in your life that you can remember where you've been discipled well and it's had a really good impact on your life? I'm going to transfer that to the, <laughs> to the online people. Oh, have you had okay. a moment in your life where you have been discipled or a person in your life who has helped you so much in your walk with Jesus? And if so, how have they done it? What kind of impact have they made? <laughs> While you guys are answering that, I'll try and answer it for myself. I'm actually currently being discipled by um, a member of the congregation here in church and we're going through a book by Peter Scazzaro, Paul Scazzaro. It's Paul or Peter? <laughs> Who knows? <One> of them. <laughs> it's Mr. Scazzaro and it's called Emotionally Healthy Discipleship. And I'm not a great reader so it has been slow for me but not because of the book, because of me. <laughs> but I've, I've loved it, seeing how to follow Jesus, how to think about faith and my, my daily walk with God in an entirely new way. And I think part of it has been recognizing the impact that everyone, anyone can have on, on you. Like, no one is, no one has a monopoly on knowledge. No one has a complete understanding of God. Everyone has something that you don't have and you have something that others don't have. So that's probably been it for me. Oh, that's really cool. Well, we're going to hear a lot more about that in our service now. And um, we'll see you back at the piece to chat a bit more about it all. But why don't we pray as we go into the service? Would you like to pray for us, Lord? I will pray. <laughs> 
Father God, we thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, because this is the day that you have made. Um, and Jesus, as we come to meet you, I pray that you would settle our hearts before you, prepare us, Lord, for the message that you have for each one of us individually. Thank you, Jesus, that you meet us um, individually. And I pray, Lord, through the service, you would be speaking to us and ministering to us. Um, so we pray, come Holy Spirit, into our rooms at home. Would you be there, Lord, and um, would you be sat with us as we watch this service? In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See you soon. Good morning, church. It's so good to see so many of you here in the church building. And a warm welcome to those joining us online. It's great to have you with us. My name is Colleen. And my name is Tom. It's great to have you here. Whether it's your first time in the building or your hundredth time, it's so good to have you. Um, it's really exciting today. We are starting a new preaching series called Follow, where we're thinking about following in the way of Jesus. So get excited for that. That's going to be really good. Stephen, our rector, is going to be speaking to us later on. Uh, but first, we're going to worship. So if you'd like to stand, and we're going to pray as we do that. Let us pray together. Father God, we thank you that we can gather in your name. Thank you that your word says that you inhabit the praises of your people. And so as we lift up our songs of praise to you, we pray that you would come by your Holy Spirit, be with us now, and fill us afresh with the knowledge of your love for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Who's up for learning a new song this morning? Yeah. Woo! Amazing. We're just going to run through some quick actions with you so that you can join fully in with the song. So whether you are two or 82 or even 92, you could join with these actions. So they, this song is all about love, God's love. So it goes, God's, uh, God said to us, the golden rule is love. So we love one another. Get your heart signs out like he loves us. Can we do that? Try this together. So... God said to us, the golden rule is love, and so we love one another like He loves us. And then it goes in the, uh, in the bridge, it goes, love is the highest, love is the greatest, but the other way around, sorry about that. Love is the greatest, love is the highest, love is the way of Jesus. Are you ready? Here we go. Yes. 
Amazing. If you'd like to grab a seat, we've just got a few quick things to let you know about that are coming up in the life of our church. Yeah, so a week on Tuesday, we have our APCM, which is basically our annual church meeting. It's a great time to hear all about what God's been doing in the life of our church, but also to hear from Stephen to give a bit of vision for what's coming in the year ahead. So I always feel really encouraged by what God is doing in our church when I go to APCM. So really encourage you to come along Tuesday, the 23rd of April, here in the church at 730 Amazing. And tomorrow night we have Behold. Behold is an amazing opportunity to worship together, spend an extended time of worship uh, in this space. We take all the chairs out, we have the band in the middle. It's an amazing, amazing time. Really encourage you to come along to that. A way to do some creative worship as well. Um, so yeah, Behold, tomorrow night, be here. It's going to be really good. There's loads of different ways you can get involved in our church. The two, three of the best things you can do. The first is to join a group. We've got loads of groups meeting right across the city. And joining a group, getting together with some friends, to have a meal together, spend some time uh, reading the Bible together and praying for each other. It's just an amazing way to get to know other people. So if you'd like to join a group, you can find out more information on our website. There's also our teams. So everything that happens here is enabled by our amazing volunteer teams. Teams that serve on a Sunday and midweek. So if you'd like to get involved in a team, again, there's information on our website, or you can chat to the guys out in the Connect stand after the service. And lastly, everything that happens here is enabled by the giving of our congregation. So if you would like to give to St. Aldates, again, you can find out more information on our website. For now, our kids are going to go out to their groups. Um, so you can either hand out these doors or the doors out of the back. Uh, follow the team leaders and they will show you where you need to go. And um, take this moment just to say hi to somebody near you. And we'll be back in just a moment to worship together again. Welcome back, everyone. We can. Send the peace to you. We send the peace to you. Oh, gosh, yes, the peace of God be with you. <laughs> Almost skipped that. Good morning to Susie in New Zealand and to Niels Olsen, who loves to connect with God instrumentally with worship. Is that that you like to play the music yourself? Are you quite musical? Or do you like to have it on in the background and let it be something that you soak in? I'd love to know. <laughs> and a very good morning to you, Sergi, and to Violet Fazal. It's nice to see you guys both back with us. Some really key members of our online community. It's actually wonderful to get yeah. to know your names, to get to know who you are. So thank you for joining us. It's great. And we had a new kids song today. That was a bop. <laughs> it was a bop. I've, I've never said that. <laughs> that didn't really sound like me. <laughs> that was such a good song. That was fun. I feel like because I was here, I didn't get to hear it properly. But um, I'm going to go back and listen to that online. Yeah, definitely. What was the actions? We've got a love, 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 love. Oh. It was good. That is exactly what we've been told to do. That's what <laughs> Jesus said. <laughs> but no, that makes me excited to get into worship. So let's do that right now. Ciao. 
I'm 
bless your name in the morning. I'll bless your name in the whatever my day. I'll bless your name in the morning. Every chance. Oh, let's bow.
of our hearts King of all the earth and yet King of our hearts We surrender and we seek you seek you, Lord. We seek you, Jesus. In this place, would you be glorified? Would you be lifted high? Would you take your right
Lord, we lift up our world to you. We thank you that you love and care for this world. And in its brokenness and hurting, Lord, we say, would your kingdom come and would your will be done? Lord, we continue to cry out to you for the many places of war and conflict. We think on Iran, Israel and Gaza, and we pray, Lord, would you have mercy? We think on the people who are grieving, who are hurting, who are suffering, who are displaced, who are traumatized, and we just pray, Lord, would you come and be their comforter? Would you bring peace? Would your presence minister to them? Would you protect them, Lord, protect the most vulnerable? And we pray, God, we speak to the world leaders and the politicians, and we ask that you, Lord, would raise up just leaders that they would rule with wisdom from above and that you would end the work of the enemy, Lord. You would disarm those who seek to bring about evil, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for the people of God in those places. We pray that you would give them courage to call on your name in these times. We pray that they would be ministers of your peace, of your hope, of your love. God, would you give them courage to hold on to you in these times? And we pray that they would be beacons of light to you in these places of such darkness. As your word says that your light, nothing can overcome your light. And so we lift up these prayers to you in the powerful, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And Father, we don't want to neglect to pray for our nation. We pray, would you raise up godly leaders? Would you establish them? Fill them with your presence, Lord, and help them to govern rightly. And we pray over our city. Father, we thank you for every church in this city. We pray that you would come alongside leaders, raise them up, strengthen them, encourage them. And Father, we pray for our church. We thank you for everything that you're doing in our community. Father, we thank you for people coming to know you for the first time, for households coming to know you for the first time. That's so exciting. We want to give you all the glory, all the honour and all the praise. Thank you for what you're doing, Lord. We long for more. Pour out your Spirit, we pray. Amen. 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 If you'd like to take a seat, thank you for worshipping and praying with us. Our speaker this morning is Stephen Foster, who's going to be starting our new series called Follow. So would you welcome Stephen? Thanks so much, and uh, it's great to be speaking with you today. Um, we're starting this new series today called Follow, and we want to look today at how to get close to Jesus. And we're going to be looking over the next few weeks about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And I actually believe that's one of the most important things that we could be looking at together in this cultural moment. Whether you've been a Christian for 20 years or 20 minutes, whether you know a lot or a little, whether you are following Jesus or you're still working out who Jesus is. One of the principal, one of the first, one of the foremost calls on your life is to be a follower of Jesus, an apprentice, a learner of Jesus Christ. And there's this word disciple, um, which is used in the Bible. And it's a slightly unusual word. It's not a word we use a lot these days, but basically it means to be an apprentice. It means to be a learner. It means to be someone who follows after a teacher. And I think your relationship with Jesus, your relationship to Jesus, is the single most transforming relationship you can ever have in your whole life, actually. And your relationship with and to Jesus is the most significant, the most transforming, the most dynamic relationship in our lives. And so one of the most important questions we will ever face is what does it look like for us to be followers of Jesus? And I just want to confess 
Over the last 20 years, I've read over 100 books about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I've read more books than I can imagine on what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. I've been involved in at least five different discipleship pathways. I even created a discipleship pathway at one stage. Um, I have spent more time thinking about this than many other things in my life. But what I have found most helpful, what I find most life transforming, what I found still speaks with remarkable impact into our day-to-day lives in 2024 is the actual words of Jesus Christ when he speaks about what it means to be his disciple, what it means to follow him. And so for the next few weeks, we are going to hear from Jesus. We are going to look at Jesus' actual words on this topic. It's almost like you could call this how to be a disciple according to Jesus. There's no better place to start. There's no better place to end. And we're going to have a look at that. And my sense is this has the potential to energize our lives, our relationships, our purpose in a new way to bring clarity out of complexity and focus in a confusing time and bring fruitfulness, I think, to every area of our lives and find real joy even in the challenging times that we might be facing. So I'm going to read uh, these two very quick passages to us now. So the first is in Matthew 4, starting at verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And then this from Matthew 16. From verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? The first thing you see in these passages is that Jesus invites you to follow him. He says, come follow me. And it's a simple, it's clear, the initiative comes from Jesus. uh, and, And as people, we have an opportunity to respond. And I just think it's worth saying right at the start that this is one of the most extraordinary things in the universe. It's one of the things that makes Christianity the most remarkable faith. Not only that God would come close to us, as we know he's done in the person of Jesus, that Jesus, God made flesh, would pitch his tent amongst us, that he would be in the midst of us, but that at God having come close to us in Jesus would then say, I want to get even closer. I want to partner with you. I want to train you. I want to lead you. I want you to be my apprentices. And so I'm going to call you into a relationship where I might rub off on you in such a way that you become like me. That is the most extraordinarily unique thing about our faith. For centuries before, no one would have predicted that. And for centuries after, people are still working out the significance of that most striking, dynamic reality. This is not like one truth amongst many truths. This is a groundbreaking, dynamic, life-transforming truth that God has come close to us. He's come close to you. He's not at a distance. He's not far off. And he wants to be in a relationship where he can shape your life. Extraordinary. So different from every other faith on the face of the earth. So different from every other relationship with a deity which might be thought up or created on the face of the earth. God is not distant, he's close. God is not uninterested, he's passionate. And he is not leaving you to your own devices. He wants to be in a relationship with you where he can transform your very life. Come, follow me. And as people, we have the opportunity to respond, to follow It's an unusual idea to be a disciple, to be someone who who is an apprentice of some sort of master, to be someone who follows after someone who can teach them. But I think the key question in life is not, would you like to be a disciple? Would you like to have your life shaped? The key question in life is, who or what 
is currently discipling you right now? Who or what is currently shaping your life right now? Because rest assured, someone or something is. That's just the way it works. And our world has an incredibly subtle and incredibly effective way of shaping people. In Romans 12, one of the translations says, do not be conformed to the world. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mould and make it like everyone else. Conform you into everyone else's likeness. Be transformed by a relationship with Jesus. Be shaped by a relationship with Jesus. To be a disciple, to be a learner, to be an apprentice with him. The Christian life begins and ends with being a disciple. It's not two categories. It's not that there's normal Christians and then there's uh, disciples. You know, I, I think the word Christian is a very helpful word because it's a word our culture still just about understands. But what does it mean to be a Christian? It means to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple. So when you respond to Jesus, it's not like there's two options. Say, okay, I want to respond to Jesus. I want to place my trust in him. That sounds pretty good. And then they're like, what option would you like? You know, would you like the Christian option? That's really light touch. Not going to impact your life too much. Bit of spiritual icing just on the cake of your life. No stress. No hard requests. Just, you know, come in, sing a few songs. You're done. You're good. Go and live your life. That's Christian. Option one. Way up. But let me tell you about option two. Option two, you know, you're a disciple. This is like the Marines of the spiritual life. They're really intense. They're quite serious. They pray in the morning before anyone else is awake. They read their Bibles. They really believe the Bible. It's crazy. And they do all this other stuff. And you're like, oh, should I be a Christian or a disciple? Not sure. How do I feel? No, there's not two options. To be someone who responds to Jesus Christ, to place your trust in Jesus Christ, to be a Christian is to be someone who follows after Jesus Christ. And Jesus invites you to be his disciple, his follower. And the choice is, will you get close to Jesus? Will you follow closely after him? Or are you going to stay at a distance? Because the reason is Jesus' model is like an apprenticeship. It's like learning a trade. You know, if you're a butcher, you can only really learn the trade of a butcher you know, right up next to the person who's training you. They don't give you a knife and a cow and say, let us know how it goes. <laughs> That's not how it works. You know, if you're a mechanic, you can only learn the trade of a mechanic next to someone who's also a very good mechanic. They don't give you a spanner and a Porsche and say, see how it goes. You have to be close. And actually, as it happens, when you train to be a lawyer, they don't just shove you into court and say, good luck. It's two stages training to be a lawyer. There's the first stage, which is uh, called bar school or, or, or law school. So I was a barrister, a trial lawyer. And, and the law school stage is really boring. I found it so boring, I almost gave up. It's like loads of procedure, loads of tests, not many people, not very interesting. And then you have what's called your on-the-job training. And it's, it's called a pupillage. It's like you're a pupil and you have a pupil master. So you, you're almost like the apprentice and you have a master. And this is like you spend six months with senior barristers. Three, I had three particular senior barristers. And, and because they're the pupil master and, and, and you're the pupil, you know, when the pupil is ready, the master appears and they come and uh, they spend time with them. And on the first day, I just remember thinking, this is entirely different. It's not like multiple choice. In this situation, what would you do? The guy was like, right, I'm your pooper master, and I'm going to train you how to do this job. I was like, right. And then he, we ate together. It was a surprise to me. He's like, right, come on, we're going to this restaurant. You know, we walked together. We went everywhere together. We talked. And he texted me in the evening, saying, right, we're going to meet at this time. We're going to go to this court. You know, we turned up at court. I was right there next to him the whole time. Wherever he went, I went. Whenever he had a conversation, I had a conversation. He went to the cells. I went to the cells. I suddenly thought, I've never been to the cells before in my life, which I think is a good thing. But I, but I just was a bit like surprised. I was like, all oh, right, this is what it looks like in the cells, in the courtroom. You know, you go into the courtroom, he's right there. You go meet with a client, an armed robber. It's like, hi, this is Steve. I'm like, oh. And then you see how he speaks to someone. Sorry, someone accused of being an armed robber. You see how he speaks to that person. And, and, and you learn from him the whole time. And he was just firing off gold the whole time. And I was there like a sponge right next to him, just absorbing it. And in, in a few weeks, it got to the stage where he looked at me one morning. He said, Steve, who taught you how to tie a tie? 
And I said, I did. And he said, that's not good enough, Steve. You look like a footballer. I was like, thank you. <laughs> and then I realized it wasn't a compliment. And, um, and so he taught me at like 8 a.m. in a Harrow Crown Court how to tie a tie. And then a few weeks later, I think he was growing in confidence around me. He said, Steve, where did you buy your suit from? And I said, Suits Direct. And he was like, Steve, that's just not going to do. And then he wrote me a check for £500 to go and buy a suit. I was like, this is unlike any other relationship I've ever had in my life. He's like a million times better than me, so significant, and yet he is actually intimately concerned to try and enable me to do this job. And I was in awe. And, uh, but just imagine if I'd have turned up and I'd been like, you know, got quite a good degree in law, actually. I know quite a lot about this. And I've read some good books about the law. So although you might have been practicing for 25 years in the criminal courts, I think this should be a two-way relationship. You know? and, 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 and made, I, mean, I don't think I would have learned much. Or imagine I'd have turned up and I'd have said, you know, there are loads of other better barristers than you out there. You know, you're hardly top 10 in the country. So, um, so I don't think I'll come to court with you. I'll keep a distance. You know, I, 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 won't, I don't want to have lunch with you. A bit weird. Don't want you to buy my suit. No, thank you. I wouldn't have learned much. And the pupil's ready, the master appears. And we're invited into this extraordinary apprentice relationship with the most extraordinary person who's ever walked on the face of the earth. Don't for a second take it for granted. But what does it look like? Well, there's a blessing um, in the Jewish Midrash uh, which says, uh, a wise disciple is covered in the dust of their rabbi. A wise disciple is covered in the dust of their rabbi. What's that going to look like? Well, um, Dittier is going to come and illustrate this for me. Would you welcome up Dittier? <laughs> so in truth, um, Dittier's I've got more to learn probably from Dittier than Dittier has from me, uh, but just for the purpose of this illustration, we'll do it this way around. And so, so just imagine that I was Dittier's rabbi and he's my disciple, and the way it would work is, you know, the idea is you'd be covered in the dust of your rabbi because wherever you went, you would go. Wherever the rabbi went, the disciple would follow. And, and it's quite a dusty context. So as the disciple walks around, as, as the rabbi walks around, the, the the disciple follows him, and so it stirs up dust, and then that dust gets on you. So it's all about proximity. It's all about being close enough. So they would work if it was like a rabbi-disciple relationship. You know, I'd go over here, and I'd be praying, and then as I prayed, um, you know, the, the disciple would be covered in the dust of my prayers, and then we'd go over here, and I'd speak to someone, and then, you know, the, 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 the disciple would be covered in the dust of how I speak to that person. It was quite dusty, actually, and um, it was very dusty in that context, and, uh, and then we'd, we'd, we'd be go and do something else, and, you know, I'd be talking to someone, and, and the, the disciple would see how I speak to that person, and... Um, it goes up as well as down, doesn't it? <laughs> and, uh, and you'd see how I spoke to that person. And then maybe you'd even see, like, we go over here, and you'd see the kind of people that I was spending time with and investing my time with. And basically, as we go through life, you'd even see how I eat. You'd see how I, you know, drink. You'd see the, the, my relationships, my immediate family. And what would happen as time goes on is that the disciple would be covered in the dust of their master, which meant the dust was proof of their proximity to their trainer, proximity to their, the person who was investing them. And the disciples' evidence of their relationship, evidence of their training, was the dust of their rabbi that they carried. Thank you so much, the TTA. Thank you so much. <laughs> so just um, don't really know what to do with this. <laughs> um, so, and that's what's happening here. So one of the things we're invited to do as we follow Jesus is to get dusty, to get close enough to Jesus so that at where he goes, we go. When we see in, in the scriptures and in life what, how he treats people, how he speaks, what's significant, what's important in the spiritual life, we learn and we take on board the dust of our rabbis. So much talk in our generation of leadership and it's important we need godly, wise, faithful leaders. But if following people is beneath you, then leading people will be beyond you. 
And we have to follow Jesus first. And as we follow him, we learn and we grow. Follow Jesus, get close and follow him. And we're not, the thing is about following someone is it's not just, you, you have to surrender a little bit of your autonomy. So a bit if I invited uh, Simon Ponsonby over to my house tonight for a drink and I, he came to the front door and I said, Jay, come in, Simon, stay out Ponsonby. It doesn't work. He's like, I can't. You either have all of me or you have none of me. And if I invite Jesus into my life and I say, come in, Jesus, stay out Lord, stay out Christ, it doesn't work. It's like we're invited into a relationship where we are the followers and Jesus leads He decides where we go. He decides what we do. And that's the invitation that provides it. So first thing we see is Jesus invites you to follow him. The second thing we see is Jesus promises to form you in his likeness. He says, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. I will make. So important. The disciples are formed. They're shaped. And to be a disciple, it's a noun. It's not a verb. But it's not. It's it's an identity. It's not just something you achieve. But disciples are made. They're not discovered. They're forged. They're not just found. To be a disciple is to be someone who Jesus is making into something. There's a promise here. Come follow me and I will make you into something. Straight away, Jesus first calls the disciple and it's clear you cannot follow Jesus and remain unchanged. Jesus is not passive and uninterested about your spiritual development, your journey of faith. He's active and committed to forming and shaping you. He wants to make you into something. And often when we start talking about what it means to be a disciple, we can focus very quickly on habits and spiritual practices and the things we've got to change and the the things we've got to changes we've got to make to our life. And those things are all good. There's nothing wrong with those things. But it's only possible to be an apprentice because of Jesus' commitment to your formation and his promise to make you into something distinct. And I want to, can I just, can I be really honest with you? Is that okay? I, for much of my life, have felt like a really rubbish Christian. Just felt really rubbish at it. Large periods of my life bit of an inadequate disciple. You know, there are times when I felt too proud, times when I felt too fearful. There's times when I felt too driven. There's times when I haven't felt driven enough. There's times I've been too focused on theory. There's times where I felt I've been too focused on doing the stuff. There's times when I felt I've needed to read the Bible more, pray more, fast more, do a Sabbath. But if, if being a disciple is all on you, then what will happen is you'll tend to swing. This is what I found. I've tended to swing between pride and despair. So when I'm doing well, I'm like, I'm a disciple with a capital D. You know, I'm here, step back world. I'm not one of these Christians. I'm on it. I'm following hard after Jesus. I'm nailing it. I'm like a marine in the spiritual realm. And, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and without realizing it, you can become slightly self-righteous. You can become a little bit proud, like, oh, I'm better than your average Christian. But then there's times when it's going badly and you're tempted to despair. And you think, well, who am I kidding? I fell asleep praying last night. Even my best efforts are tarred by mixed motives. Even when I'm really trying hard, I'm never quite sure why and what the impact will be. You make mistakes and yeah, you can feel, oh, maybe, maybe I'm not worthy to be near church. Maybe I should step away from this. Maybe I should keep a distance. Maybe I should leave it for the holier and the shinier people. And I felt like that. And it's been the hugest possible encouragement to me in my life to realize that Jesus is active in, the most, and in my formation and he's the most important actor in my formation. He says, I will make you. And the times when I've grown most in my life are when Jesus has stirred a new passion in me. Yes, it takes discipline. Yes, it takes focus. Yes, there's loads of great disciplines out there. But I love this from Jesus. It's in Matthew 18, 24. I love this. He says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. I find it fascinating that Jesus links these two things, desire and denial. 
So interesting. All those years ago, and you could not have two more pregnant concepts for our day-to-day lives today. Desire and denial. Our desires drive our decisions. And so often our desires are about the actualization of our self-interest. So we're thinking, oh, what do I desire? Well, it's myself. I I want the best for myself. I want to find myself. I want to be true to myself. I want to fulfill myself. I want to follow my self-desires. I want to promote myself or I want to buffer myself. And that can find its way in kind of this desire to be wealthy, to be fulfilled, to be successful, to be high status, to be popular, even a desire to be desired. And it's not like there's anything particularly wrong with any of those things. But in our culture, there's such an emphasis on self. And it's almost like Jesus is saying, and in fact, he does pretty much say, you're never going to find yourself by finding yourself. You're never going to be fulfilled by following your desires for yourself. Jesus says, if you want to save your life, you'll lose your life. But if you lose your life for me, then you will find it. Thomas Chalmers, the Scottish preacher a long, long time ago, preached a sermon once called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. He said, seldom do our habits and our flaws change or disappear by mere force of reason or willpower. And willpower on its own is not enough. The only way to dispossess the heart of an old affection is by the expulsive power of a new, greater affection. And that's been my experience, that the Holy Spirit has at times created in my heart a greater desire for Jesus. And that has enabled me in all sorts of ways to follow after him in ways that have surprised me. It's only possible because Jesus creates that greater affection in our hearts. I still remember I, my first year at uni, I, I knew I should read the Bible more, but I didn't want to. I found it boring. Now, I knew I should spend more time at church, but I didn't want to. I found it boring. Now, I knew I should spend more time with Christians, but I didn't want to. I found them annoying. I still meet people who went to uni at me who are gobsmacked that I'm doing this job. Like just, they don't believe me. They think I'm joking. But I didn't change. I couldn't force myself to change. I wasn't able. I didn't have the ammunition. But the Holy Spirit set my heart on fire in a whole new way. And suddenly I opened the Bible and I thought, these are the most precious words ever spoken and written. These words are like dynamite, the most amazing dynamite in our lives. I started to come to church and and feel my heart set on fire with the people at church. I started to enjoy spending time with people who were seeking after him. And I was inspired by them. I couldn't have forced myself to do it. I couldn't have beat myself to do it. I couldn't have pushed myself to do it. I needed my heart set on fire. I needed the expulsive power of a greater affection. And then Jesus says, he says, deny yourself. And then he says, take up your cross and follow me. So interesting that Jesus talks about the cross here. In Luke it says, take up his, your cross daily and follow me. There's so much uh, in our culture at the moment about spiritual disciplines. I was talking to a friend in uh, California on Thursday and he was saying, you know, There's such an emphasis on spiritual disciplines, on a rule of life, on all these kind of things, and they're great, he says. But the danger is, if you're not careful, if you're in a culture, in an environment, if you're in a cultural context where actually all the focus is on the self, quite quickly, your adoption of different spiritual disciplines and ways of living can become all about yourself and its project self and my spiritual journey and my Sabbath and my this and my that and my the other. It's all about how I can best shape myself. And the goal of spiritual disciplines, you know, is not to insulate your life from the challenges of life. It's not to separate you from the storms of life. It's not so you can build barriers and boundaries so high that the waves of the storms can't touch you. The goal of spiritual disciplines is to better position you so that you can give your life away for Jesus and for other people, knowing that you can do so trusting in him. It's not like, oh, I'm insulated 
from all suffering. I'm insulated from difficulties because I've got these practices, so actually nothing bothers me anymore. I'm completely balanced. I'm zen. I've got the perfect equilibrium. Nothing can touch me. It's not really Christianity. It's a little bit more like Buddhism or Stoicism. Christianity says we can be in the midst of those challenges and storms and difficulties and conflicts and yet have hope and strength and security, not because we've removed every irritation from our life, tempting though it may be, but because our lives are held by someone who gave his life for us. And so we can trust even in the storms, even in the challenges, even in the frustrations, even in the difficulties, he is at work in our life and he is dynamically moving for us. To be a disciple means to give your life away daily to serve God and others out of love for Jesus, embracing the cost and the discipline and the perseverance that comes from that. You can do that you know, as a monk in a monastery in the desert. You can do it working in a business trying to lead a team. You can do it creatively in the arts. You can do it as an entrepreneur, trying to make a difference where he's placed you. You can do it in a prison camp in North Korea. There's as many paths as there are people. But you do it with confidence, knowing that you can give these things up. You can incur a bit of cost. You can incur a bit of sacrifice, knowing that Jesus is faithful. That's been my experience. I've made lots of mistakes in my life. I've messed up more times than I care to remember. But I've never regretted an act of sacrifice for Jesus Christ. And I've found, yeah, when, when I've denied myself, even at times when we've been through really challenging situations, and it has felt a little bit like, in the tiniest way, taking up a cross, I've found that Jesus is faithful and he is good, and you can trust him with every inch of your life and every second of your life. So that's the second thing we see. Jesus is committed to your formation. And then thirdly, Jesus wants to partner with you. We see that Jesus wants to help others find Jesus. He says, come follow me, and I'll make you into fishers of people. And that's fascinating, because Jesus wants to make you into people who draw others to follow Jesus. To be a disciple is to be generative. It's to be self-replicating of what Jesus has done in us. Almost nothing that Jesus does in your life is to be kept to yourself. We're to pass it on. And it's one of the only times in Scripture here that Jesus talks about what practically it means. What it means in terms of outcome to be a disciple of Jesus. And, And what did Jesus do? He called people to follow him. And what's he invited us here to do? Call people to follow him. It doesn't say, come follow me and I'll make you holier than everyone else. Come follow me and I'll make you really boring. Come follow me and I'll make you super spiritual. So everyone looks, that person has nailed it. Come follow me and I'll make you more knowledgeable than your friends so you can impress them. No, come follow me, I'll give you perfect theology. No, come follow me and I'll make you into someone who helps others to follow me talking with a friend on Friday, and they said it's a little bit like a peloton. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, it's like in a peloton, in a cycle race, you have this peloton of cyclists, and, and the front of the peloton takes lots of the weight because of the wind resistance and all that kind of stuff, and then the rest of the peloton comes in after the front person, and, and they said it's almost like Jesus is leading the peloton, and then we come in in the middle, but then other people can join in after us. And actually, as we are strengthened by Jesus, we can strengthen other people too. As we are assisted by Jesus, we can assist other people too. As we are blessed by Jesus, we can bless other people too. And it doesn't really matter where you are in the peloton. Jesus is at the front. He's leading the way. He's driving the pace. He's setting the pace. And he is the one who is able to take the strain. And at times it feels like you're you're kind of pulled up after Jesus. You don't even know how you're staying on even kill. There's so much crazy stuff going on in your life. You're like, wow, I'm still in church. I don't know how that happened. And it's because Jesus is pulling you after him. And at times you're kind of aware of people behind you and you can actually draw them in too. Jesus leads the peloton. And I love this because actually I'm rubbish Personality-wise, I've always been rubbish at speaking to people about Jesus. So again, one of the great surprises of my life that I do this job. 
Because all through my teenage years, my greatest fear was anyone discovering I was a Christian. In university, my greatest fear was people realizing that I went to church. Like, I would freeze when the opportunity to talk about my faith came up. And what I love is that Jesus comes alongside the people he's calling. He instantly contextualizes the call. He says, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of people. He uses a metaphor, they instantly understand. He meets them right where they are. You know, they're on the northern coast of the Sea of Galilee, you know, the northern part of Israel. They're on the northern edge. It's almost like they're right on the edge of the edge of the edge, far away from Jerusalem, far away from the temple, and right in the middle of their workplaces, right in the middle of their day-to-day lives. Jesus turns up, and he's there with them. And in that context, he says, come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of people. You want to be with Jesus? Where do we find Jesus? We find Jesus in places like this because he says where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of him. That's why even in the worship just now, we sensed the tangible presence of Jesus by his spirit. But where else do you find Jesus? On the edge. Those places in your life which you think might be furthest away from the church. Because Jesus is always going to be with and ministering to people who don't yet know him. It's what we see all the way through the Gospels. He's there on the edge, coming alongside those who haven't yet encountered him. And the amazing thing is we are invited into this context, but we're also invited into all the other contexts in our life, by the water cooler on a Monday morning, having a coffee with someone, you know, at the school gate on a Wednesday morning, chatting to people, just being our normal everyday selves in our normal everyday lives. But you are there as a follower of Jesus. You're there as someone who's got dusty by proximity to Jesus. You're there as someone who's being shaped by Jesus. And that is powerful, really powerful. Leslie Newbig, in church planter of the last century, said, the deepest motive for mission is simply the desire to be with Jesus where he is on the frontier between the reign of God and the usurped dominion of the devil. He's there. Now, I sometimes say, Jesus isn't like a Buddha that we like, we become a Christian, here's your Jesus, and you like hang on to him, and you put him in a nice room in your house. And so, you know, once a week you can go and sit with him. How are you doing? Not bad. How are you? Yeah, I'm okay, thanks. And then you close the door and you go out and you live your life. And he's, he's somewhere else. Jesus is out there. He's on the move by his spirit. He came to seek and save the lost. He hasn't lost any of his passion, any of his power, any of his concern for this world. And the amazing thing is sometimes you turn up places and he's already there and it shocks you. I was in a shop in the Westgate, the shopping centre just near here in the center of Oxford. I walked into the shop. I, I just got chatting to this guy who ran the shop. Not, I don't even know how it started. And, and, and at some point in the conversation, I mentioned that I come to this church, which is, of course, true. I do come to this church. <laughs> and he said, which church? I said, oh, it's just in the center. He said, is that that one called St. Aldate's? And I said, yeah, that is the church. He said, oh, I've met some people from that church. He said, they're lovely people. I said, well, it's, it's a special place. And then the amazing, this amazing thing, his eyes filled with tears. And then my eyes filled with tears. And as much as I've ever felt in a conference, a big church service, I felt the presence of God in a shoe shop in the Westgate shopping center. And we kind of looked at each other, and I just said, have you got, like, someone in your family, like, and he just looked down and almost cried and he said, my grandma, my grandma. I arrived, Jesus had been there before me. And there are people in your life right now, in your workplaces, your communities, your businesses, Jesus is there before you. And sometimes you turn up and you're like, oh, the Lord is in this place. I didn't even realize it. Because he's not static. Jesus is leading the peloton, and he's going ahead of us into the places we care about. And I think one of the calls on us at this moment is to recognize the powerful presence of Jesus. in our, One of the things, I think, is such a sense of the presence of God in our services at the moment is because Jesus loves when we lift his name high. But he also loves it when we invite people to follow him. He cares about that, and he's on the move. 
and he will lead and we want to equip you. We've got so many ways. We've got amazing discipleship pathways, good ground and break ground. We've got amazing connect groups and groups right across our city. Great to be part of those. But we also want to equip you to follow Jesus wherever he has positioned you in your life. I want to equip you to navigate the challenge you're facing. I want to support you and encourage you as you see your day-to-day life filled with redemptive potential, redemptive entrepreneurship, redemptive tech, redemptive education, redemptive healthcare, redemptive finance, redemptive scholarship, redemptive friendship, redemptive parenthood, redemptive design, redemptive coffee. You will rub off on people as Jesus rubs off on you. You will leave dust the dust of Jesus in your workplaces and your spaces. Follow him close. Be made by him into something distinct and bring his transforming words and actions wherever he's placed you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's stand and we're gonna pray. And I'd love to encourage you if you're comfortable, maybe you'd like to hold out your hands as a sign you might like to receive afresh from Jesus today. Maybe you'd like to close your eyes and fix your thoughts on Jesus. And we want to ask that you would come, Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, it says in Acts 16, 7. Come, Holy Spirit. right where you are now. Maybe this is a moment for you to say to Jesus, Jesus, I've been a bit complacent about this whole area, but I want to commit myself today to being your disciple, to following after you. Maybe you've slightly lost the peloton and you want to say, Jesus, I've been following at a distance, but I'd love to get so close to you that I might get dusty. Maybe you've been really struggling just to kind of make sense of it all and you just want to say, Jesus, actually, I'm so relieved that you are the one who promises to make me into something new. And you just want to offer your, your life, your dreams, your visions, your, your relationships to him again today. And say, Lord, would you make me into something new? Come, Holy Spirit. Let's wash. God.
God, help me live a life that runs after your heart. In all I do, may you be glorified. May you be lifted high. This heart is yours. opportunity to pray with um, with you today and I had a real sense that there may be some who really feel that they are living on the edge um, and that they're perhaps a bit further off and this is just an encouragement that the Lord wants to draw you back to him it's an invitation to come back to him and you may also feel that you're called to the edge to those that are on the margins, to the least and the lost. And perhaps this is an opportunity to, to pray for you, to commission you in that. So we're gonna have a time where the prayer ministry team will come forward and we'd love to take this opportunity to pray for you. So if that resonates with you, do come forward. Amazing. So yeah, if our prayer ministry team can come forward now, if there are any group leaders who are here this morning who can come and give us a hand, we'd really appreciate that as well. Um, I just can't escape the sense that there may be one or two people or maybe more than that in the room this morning who don't yet know Jesus. And we don't want to go any further without giving you an opportunity to come to know the person of Jesus. Is that okay? <laughs> so it's going to take a moment to, to pray for that. It's a really simple prayer. It goes, thank you, sorry, please. There's no better day to choose to follow Jesus than right now. So we're all going to pray together. Can I ask you to close your eyes, if that's okay? We're all going to close our eyes. And if you want to choose today,
to follow Jesus for the first time, would you pray with me? It goes like this. Thank you. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me. sorry. I'm sorry for the things that I've done that have been wrong. And I ask Jesus for your forgiveness. Would you come and make me new? And please, please Jesus, would you come into my life? I choose today to follow you. Amen. We're just going to keep our eyes closed. If you have prayed that prayer for the first time this morning or in a way which is significant for you, can you just give me a wave? Brilliant. I can see you there on my on on the left. Thank you. Anybody else? Give me a wave really high. Amazing. I can see you at the back there. Thank you. Anybody else? Amazing. That's that's an extraordinary thing. God is moving powerfully. So if you are feeling, if if you've made that prayer for the first time today, please come and chat to me afterwards or to Colleen. We would love to get you connected in and just give you some resources to help you get you started. But if you're feeling like you're on the edge or if you are feel like you were called to the edge, we would love to pray for you. We're going to um, just have one more song of worship and we're going to uh, we'll finish up. But yeah, please come for prayer now. We would love to pray for you. Yeah, if there's anything that you need, else you need prayer for, please do come forward.
now it's been wonderful to worship and pray together people are still receiving prayers so do come forward um, but as we draw this service to an end please do stay around for ice cream and um, time after service just to be together and one final notice is that we do have love matters um, which is after the six o'clock service next week a great time to talk about issues of faith relationships singleness um, in the church so do come along for that Amazing. Let's pray before we go. Father God, we thank you so much for the way you love us. And Jesus, we thank you that you go before us into every situation. We pray that this would be a week of being close to you, getting covered in your dust as we go out into the different places that we're called to. And we pray, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you go with us. And so whatever situations we face this week, in our home life, in our work life, in our family life, we pray that we would know you close, that you give us boldness and courage to speak into those situations in your name. Amen. 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 Thanks so much for joining us. Ice cream's coming around. Don't forget to go eat your kids. See you next week. Wow, thank you, Lord. What a service and what a sermon. So many of you guys have been reacting to it down in the comments. Lauren, tell us what they're saying. Yeah, hey, Teddy. Nice to see you again. Hi, Sue. Came to St. Audits in the 80s. 80s. It must have changed a lot since then. <laughs> what was that, 40 uh, years? Wow. That was a long, yeah, long time Great ago. Time. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure this is your name. Who, Jammy Flip? <laughs> Hello. Um, Nova Scotia. Yeah. Wow. It's great. Good morning. Very early morning to you. Good morning. <laughs> and for Stephen. Me. Hey, Stephen. How are you doing? Um, Margaret. Hi, Margaret. And yeah, that's oh. everyone to say hi to. There's Look, so I many think... of you. We love it when you, <laughs> when you say hi to us. Yeah, it's so good to see how Stephen's talk there is, is landing with so many of us, both in the room and at home. And like Stephen Gordon has put in the comments, 
the Peloton image was probably my favourite bit. But what, yeah, what really spoke no, to you? No, that was really great. I mean, that as well, I just think it's... Yeah, it just kind of lifts away, isn't it? Knowing that, like, being a disciple isn't kind of this, this thing you're just having to strive towards. But actually, um, Jesus just invites us to sit with him. And um, I really liked how that came across in Stephen's talk because it, it's, it's so freeing. Yeah, no, it is honestly a, a word in season. And I'm sure that for many of you, you may have had a response and, and felt like there was something for you to take away. And if that is the case, and maybe it stirs up something in you that, that wants prayer, we would love to pray, pray for you. We, we have a team that meets in the middle of the week to, to pray over your requests. And so if you do want us to pray for you, please send your request to live at stalldates.org.uk. That is live at stalldates.org.uk. It's on the screen for you now. And we will get in contact. We'll be able to see your images. Uh, your response is as much as possible. But sometimes we don't reply. But please do know that we are praying for your requests. And we will be in contact. Yeah. And for any of you who might be new and you, you don't really know how you came here, you don't know what you're doing on a church live stream, but you do know that you felt like there was something in you that makes you want to carry on with this, I'd love to direct you to our website, to the New to Faith Next Steps section on there. It's, the link is in the comments already. Um, I've put it there. It's an alldates.org.uk forward slash next steps. And you can understand a bit more about who it is this Jesus that we believe in, that we want to follow, and who helps us walk through our daily lives. Yeah. Amen. So do, do get on the website and we're back every week um, at 9.50 on the live stream. But just before we end in prayer, we want to say hi to Jojo, to Charlene, to Sarah and to Alison. Oh, hey wonderful. guys, thank you for tuning in. It's so great to see you on the live stream. But did you want to pray for us? As Let's we... wrap it up in prayer. It's always good. Father God, we thank you for today, for all that you have done, spoken, shown us about yourself. And I pray that as we go into this week, that you would be with every single one of our members, Lord, our congregation members, those watching online, and us as well. Lord, just speak to us. Be the peloton rider in front of us, Lord, and may we follow you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So great to see you guys. Um, see you next week. See you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>